Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And we have one of our favorite guests, Morley Robbins here. And he has an amazing book that he'll hold up for you. It's called The Cure. Um, and it's all about how to cure your fatigue. And it, you can see if you're watching this, it has the C and copper on there. And we're going to talk about simplexity, how to take complex things and make them simple. And we're going to talk about what is the root cause of some of your health issues. And we're going to be talking about autoimmune disease. So if you're watching this today and you're looking at my hair going, what in the world? I got a massage last night and I literally have so much coconut in my hair, coconut oil in my hair that I've washed it three or four times and I can't get the coconut oil out of my hair. <laughs> so that's what's going on with me today. A new do. A new do. A new do for me. Yeah. So um, I've got, I'll I'll read a little bit of this question later, but uh, the girl, it's, it's a very long question. I want to start with it. Um, and she talks about how she thinks she has SIBO, S-I-B-O. And she talks about, she's, she starts off the question, it's extremely long, but she said, I see undigested food fragments in my stool. So she takes pictures and actually attaches all the pictures of basically high fiber vegetable matter and it's not getting broken down in her digestive tract and uh she's saying you know is this because i'm not i'm eating too fast i'm doing poor chewing or is this because she has small intestinal bacterial overgrowth with SIBO and what could be some of the issues of why she doesn't She's seeing all these particles when she's going poop. So that's how we're that's how we're starting today. That's quite a, that's quite a starting you know, volley. Okay. Well, uh, SIBO, you know, as you know, it's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Those bacteria are supposed to be somewhere else in the colon. They're not supposed to be in the small intestine. It begs the question: Why are they in the small intestine? Because there's too much iron. And so, people. Live, we live in this world where the medical meme is you're anemic and you're copper toxic, giving us the impression that we need more iron and we need less copper, when in fact the truth is just the opposite. We have a buildup of iron in our body because we don't have enough copper and bioavailable copper in our diet. And this has been building for the better part of a century, three generations. Uh, the number one nutrient deficiency on the farm for 80 years has been copper. It's a very simple seesaw that runs the body. If copper is down, iron will rise. And where we get thrown off is confusing blood tests with tissue levels of these nutrients. And so the blood test very often shows low iron in the blood, but it doesn't tell you what's happening to iron in the tissue. And in this case, this individual's uh, tissue level of iron in their gut, in their enterocytes, that's the cells that allow the food in, enter oocytes, um, it's jammed full of iron. And what's important to know is that the digestion or the absorption, the absorption of iron is a two-step process. Step number one is to let the iron into the enterocyte. So it needs to be, um, the valence of iron needs to change so it can get inside. But then the valence, and those are the number of electrons on the, on the um, metal, but the, the valence needs to go from plus two to plus three to get out of the enterocyte to get attached to transferrin, well, that step, that critical second step, requires copper in order to change the phalans and in order to attach the iron to what's called transferrin and get it back to the bone marrow where it can be recycled and made into new red blood cells. That doesn't happen uh, in the modern era at the rate that it's supposed to. People have too little copper in their body, and as a consequence, we have too much iron. Now, what's important to know is that this was 
formally studied by two separate research teams in 1928. In March, at the University of Wisconsin, by Dr. Harp and his team at, at uh, UW-Madison, and secondly, in May of 1928, by Dr. McHarg at the University of Kentucky. And they both had the exact same results that when they denied copper to the animal's diet, iron rose in the liver, and then it started to rise elsewhere in the animal's body. And this is what we're witnessing in the modern era, is this growing accumulation of iron in the tissue, it may not show up in the blood. And it's a very, it's a confounding issue. It confuses a lot of practitioners because they've been trained that if iron shows low in the blood, then the person needs iron. That's not true. And the, the research of Bruce Ames, who was at, at that time in 2004, was at the University of UC Berkeley. He was a, a preeminent scientist. He's still living, probably in his 90s now. But at, at his peak, he was the most quoted scientist on planet Earth. And so if this isn't Bob Jones talking. This is Bruce Ainge telling us that the level of iron in the tissue can be 10 times what shows up in the blood. Well, that's a staggering statistic. And that's not taught in doctor school. And so we just need to um, awaken to this reality that the iron that's showing up in SIBO, the, the, the SIBO that's showing up in our gut is a result of excess iron in our diet and we're not recycling it properly. The bacteria uh, are feeding off of that iron and that's going to disrupt the function of the uh, digestive process. That's why the particle, the food particles are there. And it's just a natural byproduct of this um, disruption of the natural order of things in our gut. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. <clears throat> and one thing that I was going to say for you is that, you know, a lot of people don't realize it, but like sometimes I hear people say, you know, my husband will say it too. So he'll say things like, you know, when I eat shrimp, I feel better. Or when I have, you know, organ meats or a lot of, right. you know, stuff like that or certain um, things, I feel better. And copper is found in highest amounts in protein foods like organ meats, mm -hmm. sh shellfish, fish. And so if you think about that, it, it you know, that's a big piece of the puzzle is that, you know, a lot of times people think, you know, they think copper, they think it has to do with wiring and electronics, but it's in, in your opinion, one of the most important minerals that you're taking into your body. And when you're eating seafood or you're eating organ meats or you're eating fish, you're increasing that. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Absolutely. And when you go back in the literature in the 1930s, 1940s, People were getting an infusion of copper. It was four to six milligrams a day. The RDA in 2023 is 0.9 milligrams. That's a staggering change in the amount of copper that's coming in. And the other side of it is back in the 30s and 40s, they didn't start iron fortifying for until 1941. And then they increased at 50% in 1969. So we have this double ratcheting of lowering of copper, increasing of iron. And it creates, it changes the uh, energetic field of our body on a massive scale, but especially our gut. Because as soon as you start to introduce more iron in the gut, you're going to introduce the bacteria that like to feed on iron. And the bacteria that, that really enjoy copper are going to start to disappear. And that's the other side of it that no one's, no one's even thinking about. Well, I looked up some of the signs before this call because you're such a copper expert, but I looked up if you have a lack of copper in your body, that these are kind of the, the things that are, are going to happen. If you have anemia, low body temperature, broken bones or bone loss, low white blood cell count, irregular heartbeat, pale skin or thyroid problems, you might have a lack of copper in your diet. 
And when I looked up what the recommended recommended dietary allowances are for copper, it said for adults at 900 micrograms. Right. So what are you saying is the amount of copper that you actually need? Well, I, I take at least four milligrams a day, sometimes six milligrams. Um, and when I'm working with clients, I typically tell them to start with one capsule of my recuperate. That's my supplement to help people restore their copper, which has two milligrams in it. And I said, you know, after a few weeks, you might try two. Chantel, I've got clients now that are taking as, as many as six capsules and they feel great. Now, I'm not advising them. I'm just, just trying to alert people to the fact that most people in modern in the modern era are copper deserts. And their doctor doesn't know that because the doctor doesn't know how to measure copper. They don't they don't know how to interpret the, the full body iron panel that I rely on regularly to help people understand that uh, most blood tests that are done are unicycles. They focus on iron. The full multi iron panel that I use regularly and people that I train use regularly, it's a bicycle test. A bike has a front tire and a back tire. Well, the front tire of human metabolism is iron. The back tire that has the chain and the gears is called copper. And you need to have both in order to understand what's going on inside the body. So I really emphasize the importance of knowing both sides of the equation so you have a better understanding of what's really happening inside your body. So when you say to take copper, one of the sources of copper that you can get is in organ meats like cow liver, kidneys, or heart. And there's probably very few people listening to this show that's like, yes, let me go out and get some cow liver, some cow kidneys, or heart. So what is your opinion if, like, if it if someone had the choice of taking just a copper supplement or if they were going to take, um, you know, they have all these different things that are truly where these supplements out there, some natural ones where they've actually taken those organ meats of cow liver, kidney, and heart, ground it up and put it in a supplement. Right. You talk about the differences of those? Yeah. If, if we were living in the era when Weston E. Price did his research in the 1920s, there's no question I would prefer organ meats. I mean, I was raised on beef liver and beef heart and beef kid. We had kidney stew all the time. So that would be hands down my preference. But we don't live in the 1920s. We live in the 2020s. And the problem with the 2020s is the worldwide prevalence of glyphosate, Roundup. It's a perfect copper chelator. We live with um, high fructose corn syrup, which is in everything. People don't realize how ubiquitous that sweetener is. And fructose chelates copper just like Roundup does. And then we have the added assault of modern uh, fourth generation antibiotics like Cipro. It's a copper chelator, folks. So we're, we live in an era where the copper is being taken out of our soil, out of our food, and out of our tissue. And so we don't like to think about the fact that, well the, well, the nutrient table told me that the liver had just the right amount of copper. The nutrient tables have been updated since the 1950s. We don't know how much minerals really in there. One of, one of my more enterprising students actually took uh, one of the most popular brands of um, uh, organ meats and analyzed it, sent it to a lab. And it did not have the level of copper that the company said it did. In fact, it had twice as much iron. And that's that's very frustrating to hear. It's very disheartening to hear. But we live in a very uncertain era. And so we need to go the extra mile. And that's why the root cause protocol exists. That's why the uh, the recuperate supplement exists. And, and there are other forms. I encourage people to get the uh, copper hydrazol. It's a wonderful product from uh, NIC. They're the folks that make um, sovereign silver. Well, they make a copper, a, a copper water. There's copper cream from reverse skin aging. I encourage people to use that topically because it's a great way to restore your copper. But, you know, I think, truth be known, I think people need all three. They need the water, they need the cream, 
and they need to supplement. And so it's just, we, we are challenged in this modern era with empty food that doesn't have the key nutrients. And the two most important minerals are magnesium and copper. And we and the most probably the most important vitamins are A and E, hands down, and the B vitamins. Well, you don't get B vitamins from a bottle. You get it from food, especially the organ meats. But again, it's just this very frustrating era that we find ourselves in. And it's like, Everybody, you know, everybody wants the, uh, the simple button, you know, make it easy, you know, and it's just, it's not like that. We, we need to go and do the, the added work of making sure we're getting the best possible food, organic, wherever possible, and that we're getting the right focus on our supplement routine. And, and if you're following the mainstream recommendations around, oh, you better get your D, you better, better get your K, you better take your iron, you better take your calcium you're not going to get better because it, it, it's fighting the body's natural desire to make energy. And it's not my opinion. It's very well chronicled in the research. It's just not talked about. Mm. Yeah. A lot of time, I like how you put copper, the CU um, yeah. on there, because I think that, you know, it really is such an essential mineral that you need for all of your bodily functions. And people don't realize that that copper is crucial for red blood cell formation, energy production, mm. iron absorption, yep. collagen building. And it, it just, it's a trace mineral right. and your body doesn't make copper. So you <laughs> have to get it either from your diet or from supplements. So it's, it's, you've got to put it in. And so if you're feeling bad, this could be kind of that missing ring. I really appreciate what you just said. Your body doesn't make copper. You know, I think I've probably done over 200 podcasts. I've never thought to say that. So I'm going to start to say that. I'll, I'll give you credit for that. But I think it's important for people to realize that these minerals are historically found in our food. They're missing in the food today. The whole nature of the mineral composition of soil has changed. Certainly in the last 30 years, there's been a dramatic change. But you're absolutely right. The body does not make copper. What does the body do? It uses copper. If copper is this magical battery for thousands of functions, but nobody knows that because it's not taught in high school or college or, or even in conversations with your, with your practitioner. Because they weren't taught it either, so it's just it's a it's a fascinating area. Of, there's we have a blind spot about it, but I think your point is very well taken. We have, we really need to internalize the fact that we need to eat it. We don't make it. I think it's very well said. The other thing is, I want to really reiterate what you said. I heard you say that you you need somewhere between two and six or three and six milligrams of copper daily, right and the other thing I want to make a note of is that I saw a study that said that if you have an increased copper level in your body, it actually may lower your total cholesterol and your LDL cholesterol, the yeah. dangerous kind. And I am hearing people, I mean, you know, my dad is actually a doctor and he says that people right now their cholesterol levels are through the roof okay so i'm wondering and i'm sure you would agree with me that this increased amount of cholesterol i'm sure it has a lot of other factors too but could be another piece of the puzzle of these low copper levels could affect your cardiovascular system and you need it and it will help reduce your cholesterol. I'd love to see someone's test if we said, you know, my good cholesterol is very high. I'm going to start increasing my copper. And I'd love to see if I increase my copper levels, will my good cholesterol go down? Uh, I don't think your good cholesterol is going to go down. I think your bad cholesterol. Yeah. Uh, and, we, and we shouldn't call them good and bad. They're both important. <laughs> but, um, 
this is the, the pioneering work <clears throat> me, of, a, of a famous, he's still living, he's, he'll be 90 next year, a famous copper researcher and physician. His name is Leslie Clove. He has an MD, PhD. And in 1973, he published a very important study that said that copper deficiency causes a rise in cholesterol. Now, why is that a significant time frame? Because that's when they were ramping up statins. And he was trying to poke the, the bear in the eye with his research and published a series of studies during that era between 73 and 84. But it wasn't going to stop the, uh, the statin train. Number, it's the, the first trillion dollar product on planet Earth. There's statins. Got to spell it correctly. Dollar sign. T-A-T-I-N dollar sign. And there's an enzyme, believe it or not, it's called LCKT, lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase, that turns LDL into HDL. And guess who the battery is to run the LCAT enzyme? It's a copper. And so and the, there's no mystery to this. It's just not taught. That's that's the thing. And, and the fact that your your dad is seeing this in his practice or, or reading it in the literature doesn't surprise me at all because we're three years post-COVID, and COVID stands for copper's vanished, iron's dysregulated. And what we're really learning about cholesterol, it's important to understand this, it takes 11 molecules of oxygen to make one molecule of cholesterol. So what is cholesterol? It's an oxygen sink. It's where oxygen gets stored. And why does the body store oxygen when it can't metabolize it in the mitochondria properly? It'll start to make more cholesterol. The cholesterol is actually supposed to stay in our liver. When it starts to leave the liver and go into the bloodstream, Ah, that is the clue for the clinician to know we have a problem in the liver and there isn't enough copper running the show. That's really what high cholesterol, it, it was, and, and what was the real crisis back in the 50s and 60s when there was this, you know, just this dramatic attack against cholesterol? It wasn't cholesterol, it was a problem. It was oxidized cholesterol, rusty cholesterol that's caused by too much iron in the blood interacting with the LDL to make it oxidized. And if anyone has uh, elevated LDL, the so-called bad kind, ask your doctor or, or order it online, get an oxidized LDL. It's known as OXLDL. Get an oxidized LDL test to see where your status is. Because it, it'll right away, there, there are many people who have elevated LDLs, but it's not being oxidized because they don't have enough iron in their blood, or they, they have enough iron, but it's not in an excess situation. So there are nuances to this that need to be understood not to get afraid of a rise in cholesterol. You guys, if you've been listening to my podcast, you know I've been talking about masszymes, which is a digestive enzyme from Bioptimizers. And I want you to know that here's the thing. For me, having a digestive enzyme is a game changer because one of the biggest things that happens to me is I get really tired after my meal if I don't do it, and I have a problem with nutrient absorption. So if you could be eating the cleanest diet ever, but if you're not absorbing it, that's an issue. So this month, they're doing a really great special, and you're going to get a free bottle of the digestive enzymes from my optimizers. And so all you have to do is pay a nominal shipping fee. That's it. No other strings attached. It's the best thing ever. So get your free bottle of digestive enzymes. It's called Masszymes. Go to masszymes.com slash wasteaway free and use the coupon code wasteaway10. That's it. So masszymes.com slash wasteaway free. Use the coupon wasteaway10. It's awesome. I want to talk about chelated copper and citrated copper. And I'm going to just explain what I think it means, and then you can clarify it. So 
from what I understand, chelated copper means that the copper has been bound to an amino acid molecule, a protein, in order to make it better for absorption. And then citrated copper means that the copper was bound to a citrate molecule, also making it good for absorption. So my question is, is it better to have chelated copper or citrate copper? And what's your opinion of each? Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, the, uh, the word uh, chelated, it's, a, it's from the Greek word for claw. So the, the claw holds the mineral. And, and actually, it's a, it's a double entendre. Chelation can be good and bad. Uh, they, the, the, um, the antibiotics that I was talking about earlier, they chelate the copper but make it unavailable to be, to be used. But what you're referring to is the process of chelation to make it bioavailable for digestion and for metabolism, which is a very, very good thing. Um, the amino acid form with the, with the chelation I think is a very good form. In fact, the, the kind that's in my product, it's called copper bisglycinate. That means it has two glycine amino acids. And the beauty of that particular form is it makes the copper perfectly available for absorption. Yeah. And it's just a unique property of that particular uh, chelate that it does that. As it relates to citrate, I'm very cautious about citrate. It's a naturally occurring element in our body. Uh, the the, the uh, Krebs cycle that people may remember from high school is also called the citric acid cycle, uh, TCA. And in 1968, uh, some scientists at the universe, at Florida State University published a very important article about citrate as a molecule is an endogenous inhibitor of ceruloplasm. Well, those are some really big words back to back. So endogenous means inside our body. Inhibitor, obviously, it's stopping it. And ceruloplasm is it's the copper protein that we've talked about in earlier conversations. Well, I'm, I'm not a big fan of magnesium citrate, which is a very popular brand of, of magnesium. For that very reason, the citrate molecule disrupts copper metabolism. And I'd be very cautious. There's so many better options for copper than a copper citrate. I just, I don't know that I would go down that path. I would much prefer to use uh, the amino acid chelates than to use a, a citrate molecule. Gotcha. And if you had to name kind of your top three favorite brands, what would they be? Or for a copper supplement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think I've named them already, but they would be the, the copper hydrosol from NIC, a National Immunogenics Corp. Um, it's the um, GHK copper peptide that's found in the reverse skin aging uh, copper cream. And then Recuperate, the, the product that I developed during COVID. That was my response to COVID when I realized what it was all about. And it's um, helping a lot of people to regain their mojo for those that, that um, happen to get that condition or may have had some of the after effects of that condition. So I think those would be the three that I would, would uh, highlight during your conversation. And I've been seeing a lot of cup copper supplements that are liquid lately. What is your opinion on the difference between, you know, liquid or just taking pill form? I, I think it's just a, it's a personal preference. Some people like to, to um, take the liquids. It's easy. You can add it, you can add it to your smoothies, things like that. Um, I don't know that one is necessarily more bioavailable than the other, but it's just, I think it's a convenience factor. Some people just like the ease of the liquid. Some people like the idea of adding the, the supplement uh, to their um, food routine, and it's just a, a nice way to bring that nutrient into the uh, digestion process, which is really key. So one of the things that I heard you say is that you kind of need to figure out for yourself what your most beneficial daily dose of 
supplemented copper would be. And so maybe just start with two and then see how you feel and then move it up to three uh, grams and kind of go from there. Because the, you do want to be careful because I did read somewhere where if you take too high of an intake of copper, that you could impact your own zinc and vitamin C levels in a in a negative way. Can you speak on that? Yeah. You know, well, there's, there's nothing more confusing than uh, the zinc-copper ratio. Uh, there's nothing more confusing than whole food vitamin C versus ascorbic acid. Um, so the, where copper gets its bad rap, if you will, copper is, uh, it's central to our physiology. We, we know that, um, what people don't realize is that copper creates the energy. Copper clears the exhaust. Copper is carrying the, the electrons. I mean, it just, it goes on and on. Everything, everything, all the colors in our body are colored by copper because of a copper enzyme. Uh, they, the, the, the reach, the, all the connective tissue, copper connects everything. All the connective tissue in the body. 45% of our body is connective tissue. Did you know that? It's an enormous amount of, of uh, tissue is tied up in connecting the dots. But all of that connective tissue is made by one enzyme called lysyl oxidase. It's a copper enzyme. Um, so copper has this ubiquitous presence, but nobody knows about it. And so um, what's important for people to realize is that one of, one of its uh, most important properties is its ability to mobilize iron, keep iron moving, keep it in circulation, keep it recycling, which is what Mother Nature wants from iron. It does not want iron stuck in the tissue. It does not want iron showing up in the bloodstream. Oh, well, my serum iron, when my serum ferritin is X, Y, Z, it's like, it shouldn't really be there, to be honest. And so there's a lot of confusion around that. But the bad rap for copper comes when the iron gets mobilized, and the iron does, in fact, create oxidative stress, and iron does, in fact, create symptoms. And so people blame the copper when, in fact, it was the iron that's causing it. So that's a really important characteristic for people to understand. So as you wanted, my whole strategy is, is go low and go slow. With What are most people doing when they don't feel well? They want to go as fast as they can. You know, they want to get well yesterday. And the body does not respond to that well. And so um, we have to be very thoughtful about uh, introducing the, the uh, stops and starts of the root cause protocol. Just by doing the stops, there's a lot of relief that comes by getting rid of some of these supplements that people think because they heard it on the internet. You know, oh, I need to be taking X, Y, Z. But no, you don't. And there's a lot of um, explanation for that on, on our website, rcp123.org. So people just need to step outside the mainstream narrative and begin to realize that there's more to the story. And it's all about allowing the body to repair itself, to restore its balance naturally. And, and there's no rush here. And, and I know... There's times when we all feel bad, but you can't you can't push a string, and so that that creates a lot of confusion. The whole dynamic about the copper zinc ratio uh, is in large part a byproduct of the work of, of one individual. His name was Carl Pfeiffer. Uh, he was a PhD and an MD. He was a psychiatrist, and he was also a uh, principal in the MK Ultra program. That should make people a little nervous right now. To think that the person who was involved in the MK Ultra was advising us about copper and zinc. Uh, so zinc, zinc should be found in our food. It's very prevalent in meats and things like oysters. Um, it, it is not advised to take it from a bottle. Uh, the, the properties of zinc are very powerful and it shuts down copper metabolism. There's meticulous research about that. And so people just need to be very, very careful about that. And 
we just need to know that the, the, the body, uh, when it's introduced to the uh, nutrient focus that we have in the RCP, the body responds by making more energy, and then the body will gradually bring the body back into balance, right? back into homeostasis. That's really what the goal is. And the body does have a blueprint, but that blueprint runs on energy, and that energy comes from copper. Mm. One of my friends um, just told me about he got an autoimmune disease called polymyalgia rheumatica. And, um, you know, more and more I'm hearing, I mean, I have friend after friend who's like, I have psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. I mean, the, the rheumatologist in our area here in Virginia Beach, if you want to go see a rheumatologist right now, you have a six month wait at a minimum. That's how much the rheumatologists are booked up right now. And so I guess the question is, I want you to kind of for for autoimmune issues in general, what are some of the root causes that you're seeing that besides copper, what else are you seeing that is a major issue or why we're seeing autoimmune issues just skyrocket? Yeah. So you got to bring people back to the book, take the time. You can get it in audio and listen to me yammer for 10 hours, but get the background of what happened. And this book was written during COVID. I want you to understand that. There's no mention of the word COVID, but it was written during that time period. What people need to understand about um, autoimmune, there are over 100 autoimmune conditions now. That's that's a staggering development in our in our physiology. And we're led to believe that there's a separate, that they're like mailboxes. Each one has a separate combination or a key that's needed to open up the box so we can treat it. No, you don't. No. When I was in, in college, I worked in the mail room. I worked on the other side of the mailbox. I had access to everybody's mailbox. And that's the way copper works. It has access to everything. And so what people need to understand, the characteristics of autoimmune are threefold. When there are cells in our body called macrophages, and macrophages are the Pac-Man that gobble up the dying cells. That's their job. And macrophages will acquire iron as they're doing their work. And that iron goes into what's called a protein called ferritin. And, it, and that ferritin uh, can hold a lot of iron. But sometimes the iron is so great that the ferritin gets denatured and it becomes what's called hemosiderin. Well, hemosiderin is a tenfold increase in iron. And what's a characteristic of all autoimmune conditions is hemosiderin laden macrophages. So, so what's the number one problem? There's too much iron in the tissue. The second condition are parasites. Very important uh, work by uh, an animal farmer in Australia. Her name was Pat Colby, C-O-L-E-B-Y. She's written books on natural goat care, sheep care, cattle care, and horse care. And in each of those four books, she talks about any animal that is copper deficient will have parasites. Any animal with parasites slash autoimmune is copper deficient. So there's parasites, and guess what they're feeding on? The hemosiderin laden macrophages. And then the third characteristic of autoimmune is emotional distress. And most of these people are in some state of fear. And I spell fear differently. It's F E hyphen A R. That way we sim see the symbol for iron. F-E is the symbol for iron. And what, what does the A-R stand for? Well, iron activates rust. And that's prevalent in every autoimmune condition. Is this buildup of iron, but it has an emotional tie to it. And what, what people need to do is address both 
sides of the equation. They've got to deal with the iron and they've got to deal with the fear. And with the iron, it's the protocol and blood donations. With the fear, I encourage people to use uh, some sort of emotional release technique, whether it's EFT or um, body code or EMDR. We need to release the fear that we're broken, which is what's behind every autoimmune condition. When someone's told they have Hashimoto's or Sjogren's disease or lupus or you name it, or rheumatoid arthritis, oh my gosh, which that that condition gets tattooed on their forehead, and they they basically cave, and they go into a subliminal state of fear. I'm broken. You're not broken. You're out of balance, and we need to go through a very deliberate process to release that fear that we're broken, so that the body can heal itself. Because there really is a cure. And, and the way I spell cure, right? C-U hyphen R-E. What does that really mean? Copper regulates everything. And that's what that word really means. So one thing I want you to just repeat, because I, I'm afraid that people are going to hear what you're saying. And you're saying when you have iron in, a lot of times people think, okay, I am anemic. So they're saying my iron is low. So they're tuning you out. But right. what you're saying is there's iron in your tissue, but not in your blood. I want you to explain that for someone who maybe just went to the doctor. They're telling them their ferritin is really low and that they are anemic. If that is you, I want you to repeat back because in their mind, they're thinking, what he's saying is not making sense. So I want you to really simplify it and dumb it down as yep. much as possible because I'm hearing people left and right getting these reports that they're anemic, that their ferritin is low. Explain it as simple as possible. We're at the very epicenter of programming. So everyone's being taught that they're anemic. And they've been taught that anemia means low iron. Not true. There's more to the, the story. So there's actually three different containers for iron. There's a bucket of iron in the body. You know how big a bucket is? And that's where 70% of the iron is found in our hemoglobin. And if you include the myoglobin in the muscles, it's actually 80% of the iron. It's this enormous bucket of iron. So that's container number one. Second container is a teacup. You know how small a teacup. We're not talking about a vente latte at Starbucks. We're talking about a little teacup that our grandmothers would have used. Eight ounces, small little container, and that's called serum iron. But the iron is actually supposed to be inside the cell, not in the blood. The blood is outside of the cell. That's a very important distinction blood is outside of the cell. The ferritin is supposed to be stored inside the cell. That's 10%, about 10% of the iron. Then there's a third container. It is called serum iron, and it's a thimble of iron. It's a little tiny bit of iron. It's one-tenth of one percent of iron is in the serum, and it's measuring the iron that's available for the recycling system. So what people need to know is that every second of every day, and we've been talking now for about 50 minutes, but every second of every day, we need to replace two and a half million red blood cells every second. And in the course of 24 hours, we've replaced two trillion red blood cells. Those are big numbers. That's a lot of that's a lot of red blood cells. And what will surprise you is to find out that it only takes 25 milligrams of iron to replace 2 trillion red blood cells. 25. So pic picture a capsule, a nutrient capsule holds 1,000 milligrams. We need 25 milligrams of iron. We have, we have supposed to have five capsules of iron in our body, 5,000 milligrams of iron. And 25 of it is for this recycling system but here's what will shock you, is to find out that 24 of those 25 that are needed every day 
come from a recycling system that's run by copper. That's not well known. That's not well understood. And so when people are being told that their ferritin is low and they, they're told they are anemic, we have to understand that there's a difference between how things show up in the blood and how things show up in the tissue. There's an enormous difference. Again, back to Bruce Ames. Tissue iron can be 10 times higher than what shows up in the blood. When the when the serum ferritin when serum ferritin is elevated, it's easy peasy. It means that the liver is under stress. There's inflammation, and there's copper deficiency in the liver, causing the rise of, of ferritin in the in the blood. That's very straightforward. What's not so straightforward is what is low ferritin. Again, we're led to believe that low ferritin means oh your iron stores are low and you're going to die. Well, that's not true because it's less, it's around 10% of the iron is in the ferritin. But what's supposed to show up in the blood is a very small amount. But the catch is there's two organs involved in the recycling program. There's the spleen and there's the liver. They're both intimately involved in recycling iron. Well, we know that when, when ferritin is high, it's the liver under stress. Well, it turns out when the ferritin is low, it's the spleen that's under stress. And it, it too can become copper deficient. And when it becomes copper deficient, it's not making the ferritin protein and it starts to show low. The other uh, factor that's involved in this is when the blood is exposed to too much sugar, there's an enormous increase in the glycation of the red blood cells. And that needs to be dealt with in the spleen. And that will cause it to back up. And that too will cause the ferritin, the seroferritin to go low. It's not a sign of low iron. I, I don't know how, how many times I'll need to say this in the rest of my life. I've probably said it 10,000 times now. But there is no such thing as anemia on planet Earth. It's it's impo it's it's physically impossible because iron is the number one element on this planet. Thirty six percent of the Earth's composition is iron. And prior to COVID, I would have argued that humans were the most evolved species on the planet. Now I'm not so sure, but in order to believe that anemia is possible on planet Earth, there's two conditions. You have to get past the fact that. Yeah, which what you really have to get past is the most evolved species on the planet has lost the ability to metabolize the number one nutrient on the planet. And that doesn't pass the SNP test. And it's copper. Copper is what enables us to metabolize iron. You even said it in, in some of your opening remarks. I read some articles about low copper and anemia is one of the first signs of copper deficiency. It's right there, it's in the literature. But the knee-jerk response in medicine is, you're anemic, you need more iron. And that's not true. What you need is more bioavailable copper. And that's what the protocol is all about. And people just need to, they need to step back and say, you know, I've been taking iron for a lot of years from my anemia, and I still have anemia. Maybe I know how to try this copper thing and see what happens. Well, I'm living proof because you, I actually showed you my test. My ferritin was extremely low. Right. My iron was extremely low. We did a podcast together. I started taking the copper and my iron skyrocketed. So I am living proof that that works. I want you to mention what you said about the spleen, because just for you guys who don't know, your spleen is just a fist-sized organ that's on the up left side of your abdomen. But if you if you have pain in your spleen, could that mean that you are low in copper by chance? Yeah, because if you're low in copper, the organ is going to start to fill up with iron. And that pain is going to be the iron jamming the works. It, it happens all over the body. As iron starts to fill up in the liver, as iron starts to fill up in the heart, or the kidneys, or the spleen, or the thyroid, 
or the brain, what do you think neurodegeneration is? It's iron accumulation in the brain. So it, it, this is all, it, what's, what's fascinating, Chantel, is that it's so well chronicled in the literature, but it's not taught in the classroom. And so it's just, it's, it's this mind-numbing reality. And let, me, let me show the listeners this one article that I'm, it's a seven-page article. It's taken me two days to get to page five. It's about iron and glucose and fat metabolism and obesity. And the author's names are Hilton and Guppy. It's 2023. I think it's from April. So I know it's a few months old. I know it's really old news already. But this article is, she didn't tell it's one of the most important articles I've ever read because what it does is it definitively, some of the, some of the best citations I've ever read and as my wife, Dr. Liz, teases me, you're the only guy I know who reads the footnotes of the footnotes. And I do. And so that's why it takes me two days to get through five pages. But this article connects the dots between buildup of iron in the tissue with hyperglycemia, hyperinsulin, insulin, anemia. I mean, it's absolutely definitive. And people need to realize that the metabolic syndrome that's now affecting 40% of humanity has four, four conditions. They're called the four highs of metabolic syndrome. They're called hypertension, high blood pressure, hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, hyperlipidemia. We were talking about high cholesterol, high triglycerides, and then hyperuricemia, high uric acid. Most people don't know what their uric acid is. Oh, I, I don't know. Oh, I don't have gout. But rising uric acid is what drives metabolic syndrome. If you have PCOS, if you have any kind of heart condition, cancer, you name fatty liver disease, neurodegeneration, I can assure you, you have dysregulation with your uric acid. And so picture Mount Everest. Well, that Mount Everest is dysregulated uric acid. The top one foot is gout. The 19,499 feet below it is metabolic syndrome. And so people need to realize that these conditions are well documented in the research. They're just not well taught in the classroom because there's no money in a cure. And that's what we're bumping up against. That's the cold, hard reality. There is no money in a cure. I just find it really uh, inspiring, and it's uh, very, it's, a, it's an integrity issue for me. I want people to know the truth. I want people to understand that their body is beautifully designed by our maker and mother nature. It just needs the right nutrients to run the blueprint. That, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, I'd love for you to send me that article. I want to see if I can find it online, and I will share it with the listeners. Thank you for what you were sports. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, I would love to take a look at it as well. And I just, I want to thank you for all the work that you do. You just give so unselfishly of yourself and of your time, and you are just making such a huge impact on people's lives. And I just want to tell you how much I appreciate all that you do. Because you very kind of me. really just are just a wealth of knowledge. And I want to show the book one more time. I'd love for you guys to go out and buy this book. You can find it on Amazon. It's called Cure Your Fatigue, Morley Robbins and Copper. I'd love for you guys to just try it and give us feedback. You know, just try it. Good. See, see how you do. See if it makes a difference. All right. Well, you guys stay tuned. We've got an, oh, I want you to repeat your website, Morley, because for the root cause protocol one more time, please. As well. Yeah, it's RCP for root cause protocol, rcp123.org. And just go to the resources tab and you'll have oodles of things to occupy your day with in terms of articles, podcasts, there's online community, there's a course you can take, things like that. So it's a lot of information. And we will also go ahead and put 
that root. And you can also go to rootcauseprotocol.com, can't you, as well? Absolutely. That's right. Protocol.com. The root cause protocol topic. Either one you can do. We'll put both of those into the show notes as well. Thank you again. And you guys stay tuned. We've got another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye. Thanks again.